my long held view, which I've espoused for many years, uh, um, was that ultimately the bond market would take the printing press away from the Fed. The Fed has push the envelope for a very long time, helping the government kick the can such that now we've got $36 trillion in debt and nobody thinks that there's a problem, that the currency choices are especially poor, the worst I've seen in my lifetime. Um, and that's one of the reasons why gold has done well. It's done well because central bankers around the world that aren't part of the G7 clique are buying gold, as are Chinese and Indians and, and thoughtful Western investors. There's been no real stampede in America. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the FJR Mining Guy over on X and, of course, your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming Bill Fleckenstein. He is the founder of Fleckenstein Capital and somebody been trying to get on this channel for a long, long time. And uh, before we get started, I do have to apologize to Bill publicly here because I had to reschedule this interview like three or four times. My train was delayed. I was traveling. It was all on me. And I do apologize. And I thank Bill for making the time for us here. Um, before I switch over to my guests, though, hit that like and subscribe button. It is the free way to support us, and uh, it's definitely worth it. Trust me. Check out the other videos on our channel. Now, without much further ado, Bill, it is great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for making the time. Well, it's uh, nice to be here. So let's go. Yeah, absolutely. We got lots to talk about, uh, lo lots going on in the world. It feels like d despite what's going on in the world, we're a bit in limbo. But that's what my gut is telling me. And uh, I'm really curious what your current assessment of the economy and maybe the financial market is, just to see where your head is at, and then we'll get into some of the details, of course. Well, I think the um, the economy has been in somewhat of a uh, you know stagflationary environment for the last year or so, perhaps a little longer. And when I say stagflation, what I mean is the nominal rate of growth, real growth, sorry, the, the rate of real growth and the rate of inflation aren't all that far apart. You know, so if you're growing at 3% and inflation is 3%, yes, that's 6% rate nominal and 3% real, but the fact that the inflation component there is large um, uh, causes the, the, the data and people to behave slightly differently than if it was, um, you know, say uh, 3% real growth and 1.5% inflation. The problem with the inflation rate calculations is uh, twofold. One, everyone's rate or various different age groups or economic strata have diff experienced different levels of inflation. And the inflation data is measured rather poorly. Um, I wrote a book about Greenspan uh, called Greenspan's Bubbles, the Age of Ignorance of the Federal Reserve, published in early 08. And one of the chapters I devoted to it was the CPI calculations and how 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 warped they are between hedonic substitution, which means that if the price of something triples, but the government decides the utility of it quadrupled, they say that it declined in price by 25 to 33 percent. Whereas you're just trying to buy a computer and you have to pay that big price anyway. Um, there, there are lots of other things. Owner's equivalent rent, substitution is another bad one. So the CPI is, is, is a poor calculation. Nonetheless, from, say, call it the mid-90s through, uh, say, 2020-ish, people didn't really worry about inflation much. I don't think the rate of it was as low as the government would have you believe, but no one was too fussed because the economy, X the wipeout from the two bubbles, did well and people were making money in financial assets or real estate or both. The, both of those periods, one with the stock bubble in the late 90s and the real estate bubble in 08, were caused by the Federal Reserve um, uh, 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 approach to monetary policy, which is generally be way too easy, too long, cause a problem, create an accident, go back and start over. That's what happened after the 2000 bubble. That happened after the 08 bubble. Then we got to 2000. They tried out the same playbook in response to COVID. And they got so drunk on their own press clippings that they believed inflation was virtually impossible to start. And they were doing QE up to about a month before they started raising rates. They completely mishandled the period. And what's different in, in the wake of that is now people have seen prices go up dramatically. 
And what those of us who've lived through prior inflationary periods, like I was around and and uh, old enough to understand, to kind of understand what was going on in the, in the 70s and certainly all through the 80s, um, um, is that if the price of something goes, let's just pick a number, the price of some item uh, or, or a basket of goods that you really have to, to buy repeatedly goes from a dollar to two dollars, similar to what we saw during COVID. But then the price increases are just like a penny or two at a time. The government will say that the rate of inflation is down to 1% or 2% and everything's okay, except you're still dealing with the 100% price increase plus or minus that you that you've been dealing with for, for, since it occurred, right? They don't ever those don't ever get taken back. Uh, some might partially, but net net, when people are continually paying this high price for their basket of goods and services, and then the government or the Fed or the uh, the um, BLS is trying to tell you that inflation is only two percent, so the Fed can start cutting like they just did. People don't believe that uh, because they say, wait a second, I'm still dealing with this inflation. It doesn't get discussed that way, but that's the fact and that impacts psychology. My long held view, which I have espoused for many years, uh, um, was that ultimately the bond market would take the printing press away from the Fed. What do I mean by that? I mean that at some point the Fed would cut rates and the market would say, you've made a mistake. We're worried about inflation. We're not going to go along with that. And therefore they would cut rates and the bond rates from you know seven to ten seven years and out would rise. Well, that's what's happened in the la in the wake of the last two recent rate cuts. Now, some people will say, well, there's almost always a knee-jerk sell-off after the Fed cuts if it's been anticipated. And while that's true, this feels quite a bit different to me. So um I feel like we are in the early innings. Or, or said differently, we have to pay close attention to the fact that potentially the bond market has lost some element of its confidence in the Fed. And if so, given the size of our budget deficit, um, that's going to be a real problem prospectively. So I think the inflation problem is mentality is going to stay with us. Um, I don't I think the economy would be in recession, probably were it not for the massive six or seven percent of of, of GDP that is the budget deficit, which helps obviously keep the economy growing, then you've had strong financial markets. Now, the financial market cannot be analyzed on its own. I don't know how familiar you, were, you are with the work of Mike Green and the distortion caused by the passive bid, which is the vanguards and the Black Rocks who take retirement money that gets sent to them and they buy it in their quote unquote passive index fund. The problem is, as a percentage of, of activity, it's somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. And as it goes from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, it, it radically distorts the way the markets behave, particularly in the high priced stocks. Now, I don't want to waste, take a lot of your time to go into that. I would encourage anyone who wants to know more and anyone who has one cent in the equity markets. Well, maybe one cent doesn't matter. But if you have any decent amount of money in the market, you need to understand this phenomenon because if it ever starts to reverse, there's going to be there will be a huge collapse in the, in, in, in the markets. And uh, so I'm not saying it's imminent, but it's a variable that you have to be aware of. Thus far, it's made prices go up and people think that that's great. But that's one of the reasons why there is no breadth in the market is because all the action has been, you know, in the um, the Apple, Nvidia, Microsoft, Google, you know this group of stocks, and to think that four or five of them have such a you know I think it's might be thirty or forty percent of the S and P I, I forget the number off the top of my head shows you how distorted things are. This isn't really a, a real market. This isn't the, this isn't the market environment that existed prior to when these market shares started to really grow in the 2015-16 period. And you combine that with what the Fed has done from QE and you've got this milieu of this crazy equity market um, that continues to, 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 to grind higher. Now, we're at an interesting moment in time in that in the wake of the election, people have a lot of expectations of the things that the Trump administration may do, which could be, you know, uh, unleash animal spirits and be bullish for the economy. Um, I think that a lot of people haven't 
realized that when Reagan was elected in 1980, there were a lot of those same views, but we cut cap tax rates from 70 to marginal rates, I think got down to 30. Um, um, capital gains rates were cut. And also the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP was about a third of what it is today. Of course, we had interest rates that were in the 15 or 20% because trying to break inflation. But the point is, even if you think good things are coming, sometimes they take longer to play out. So what happens is people get excited in the equity market. They buy securities based on that. And then the reality of getting to where, where they thought we were going takes a year or so and the interim prices go down. Anyway, I think we're going to we had this we had this big gap higher after the election. And uh, tonight was we're recording this tonight in video reports. And if it can take the market higher, maybe it rallies into year end. And if it can't, maybe we've seen a peak. So it's kind of an interesting moment in time. I ran on for a long time in your question, but I couldn't stop myself. So there you go. There's a small group of people that also want to access the liquidity of their gold and silver without selling it. And so the option there is to use it as collateral for a loan. Just like a home equity line of credit, we offer a gold-backed or silver-backed line of credit. And if you have gold or silver in our depository and you want a line of credit against it, we're able to do that as long as it's for commercial or investment purposes. We can loan somebody up to 75% of the value uh, in many cases, that's a, a great solution for folks who don't want to actually have to sell uh, their precious metals in order to pull cash out of it. And it's an interest-only loan. It's a revolving loan, meaning you can pull out your line of credit and you can pay it back down at your option. It's not something that you have to keep fully drawn. It's available to you when you need it, and that way you can minimize interest and pay it down when you don't. Himalaya Mountains um, in, in India, it's like just the, the mountain range, peak, 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 it drops. And we're just at the beginning coming out of that valley again. Is that something you're worried about? Is that the momentum of rate of change for unemployment, for example? Well, I think you really have to dig beneath the surface in a lot of these cases. Um, you, you, you know, the, the, the employment data is always corrupted by the birth death model, right? And you, you know what that is, right? Or shall I go, okay, shall I give you, you, you can explain for our viewers. I know what it is, but That's I think it makes sense to clarify. Okay. In, a, in a nutshell, the BLS assumes that during an expansion, a certain amount of businesses are created. And they assume in a, in a, in a decline or a recession, there are uh, bi businesses die. It's a death. That's the birth death model. So they assume that. And therefore, based on that assumption, they assume that a certain amount of jobs are created as a consequence of their birth death model. And what always happens at inflection points, even when you're into recession, they're claiming that you're still creating jobs. And then, of course, in a recovery, they claim you're still losing jobs. So at inflection points or around inflection points, the birth death model is wrong. And that's why we've seen so many large revisions lower. That's a long way of saying that the, the quality of the employment report is somewhat suspect. And it's even more hysterical to think that people speculate about what's going to happen in the future based on lagging data, which is employment data, and what and data that's so distorted. So why this is the speculative statistic of the month every month, I don't know, but it is. Anyway, it's really you really have to dig into the data to understand what's really happening, and 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 of course that's often the case on almost any topic. Do you look at the U6 unemployment numbers at all, Bill? Is that uh, sometimes, you know, it was important after the 08 collapse, right, to try to get a sense on how bad the employment rate really was because uh, you, you, you want to tell people what that is? You want me to go ahead and tell them. No, it's based on calculations back on the 19, in the 1980s. So it's more apparently more historically accurate, uh, the unemployment data, and it's much higher than the current uh, provided number for right, 2%. Right. And it's then more like 7.7. And there's also the, yeah, the component of people looking for work that can't find it. Anyway, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bits in there, but I, I don't think the nuance in that data will tell you more than recognizing the fact that that the size of the budget deficit, as big as it is, with as many transfer payments as are in it, it is, a, is a stronger economic variable than teasing out the parts of the employment report. That, that's what I think about.
So, 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 Bill, like we're always doom and gloom on this channel. We're always almost seemingly alarmist because we, we got the data. We're looking at the U.S. debt and many other data points. We just discussed unemployment. But looking at the bond market, you brought that up in your earlier answer. 4.4% uh, on the 10-year. Like, how, how much of a, just a technical correction is that? And like, how much should we be worried about 4.4%? Maybe the bond vigilantes may be coming back and pressuring Jerome Powell into a direction he doesn't want to go. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> First of all, we can't know, all right? I've had this theory for a while, which I've espoused many times in interviews about what, what, what the end game would be for the Fed was when they lost control of the bond market. I felt that was always going to be the end game because I knew they would go too far. I didn't know when it was. So this looks like the early stages of that. We can't know if it's a head fake or if it's a start of something for real until we get farther down the road. That's why markets always are. You don't know, is this like just a, a little bitty blip or is it the start of a new trend? But the fact that in recent weeks, you've seen Stan Druckenmiller, Paul Jones, um, and other extraordinarily smart and successful uh, market speculators um, uh, come to the view that the bond market was uh, in a bad place and they wanted to be shorted, a view that I've espoused, um, that means that there's maybe a better chance in this go round that this is the signal and not noise. So we, you, you can't really tell in the early stages of a new move. I mean, the bond market, the bond bull market ran from 1981 to call it 2021. Okay. That's 40 years. There was a lot of head fakes along the way. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so we could be on the verge of a 30 or 40 year struck us, you know, generational bond market, but a bear market, generational bear market for bonds. Bonds tend to trade in these 30 or 40 year cycles for whatever reason. Maybe it has to do with you need to have enough people forget what happened or whatever it is. I don't know, but that's that's the way it's been for, you know, well over a century. Uh, so I think you have to look. When you're talking about the negatives, you have to be aware of them. It doesn't mean it's time to act on them, or, 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 but you have to understand the game it is that you are playing. And so you have to be aware that, that, that the Fed has pushed the envelope for a very long time, helping the government kick the can such that now we've got $36 trillion in debt and nobody thinks that there's a problem. I mean, yes, people pay lip service to it, but no politicians are going to do anything about it. So knowing that, you know, the, 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 the Fed is prone to make these errors, we still have an eight trillion dollars, seven and a half trillion dollars in the balance sheet, which, you know, Bernanke said would be a breeze to get rid of when he started this up in 09. Um, so the, 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 the Fed is kind of trapped. They only have one lever, which is to ease. And if the easing can't be done because of the bond market, that is a big problem. OK. Now, when you look at the fact that the stock market is so warped by the passive bid, you have to know that's a dangerous thing. I said a dangerous structure. I, I'm aware of both those things. I don't have, except I have a small token short position because I, being aware of those potential problems doesn't mean it's time to act on them. And particularly the passive bid has warped the equity market when I finally bumped into Mike Green and I understood this, it made my life a lot easier because I could understand the why the markets behaved so bizarrely and in such a dangerous way. Well, it's been now four years since I've understood that. Um, and I could talk about the negatives all the time, but that doesn't mean I'm doing anything about them, right? In fact, I have more speculative longs than I have speculative shorts, although that could change in you know a day. Um, and I don't have a lot of them either. Um, but so back to your point about negatives, you have to be aware of them. You can't be like this dumb shit. Tom Lee says, you know, buy them every, well, look, if you were a parrot and you could only say one thing, which was buy them and you did it every day for the last 15 years, you'd look like a genius, but that didn't mean you had any analysis behind it or it meant anything. I don't mean to necessarily pick on him. Um, in, he's just an example. I don't know him personally. He could be a terrific guy for all I know, but I want to make that point and because a lot of times what happens with people that are amateur or you know retail investors don't do this full time 
is if somebody's been right for a while, they assume they're always going to be right. Or similarly, they're going to be, if somebody's been wrong for a little while, they think you're always going to be wrong. Well, look, you can find the very best guys in, on the planet in investing and they're wrong all the time. And they'll tell you that. So the trick is when you're wrong, you, you, you don't get bigger while you're wrong and you try to only get bigger when things are going your way. And you don't always know if what you think is unfolding is sometimes you have to just test drive a little bit. In any case, there's nothing wrong with bringing up these negative points because people need to be aware of them. The, the bubble vision is not going to tell you. And the mainstream media, as we've learned on a lot of different topics, wouldn't know the truth if it smacked them in the face with a shovel. So where are you going to find this out? You have to turn to podcasts such as yours. And so I, I, I felt like you were like um, sort of apologizing for having the negative. And that's, and, and, and it's, it's, it's not that, that you are negative, you're pointing out these risk factors and what, and folks have to take them into consideration. Uh, you want me to tell you where to mail the check? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, just tell all your friends where to find it and uh, it's all fine. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, but it always sounds so alarmist. So doom and gloomy, right? It's yeah, like the world's going to I, end. And listen, I've been, a, I've been in public and vocal since the nineties. I used to go on bubble vision a lot uh, until I decided they were just the devil and I didn't want to be involved with them. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so I used to get a ton of grief you know, well, in the run-up to the blow-up of both bubbles, I was negative. I was on TV. I wrote a column for MSN. I was very vocal, and people would laugh at me and they'd goof on me. And then when when things collapsed, it wasn't so funny anymore. And so I I'm sensitive about being called a perma bear, but but I, I'm not <laughs> not at all. Um. So but but so that's why I was trying to make that point because I think the people that are listening to you or watching this show need to know that need to know how that's how they have to parse the news you're taking in information you're taking in information and if we just took this this um bond market backing up idea i've been talking about like i said for for two or three years regularly saying i didn't know what was going to happen and now i think it may have started well if someone had been listening to me the thing that they should note is oh the guy who's been telling me about that thinks maybe it started maybe i should pay attention and then when Paul Jones and Stan Druckenmiller kind of say the same thing and say, well, maybe I have to pay a little more attention. And maybe you're thinking about locking in a new mortgage rate. Well, you have to give it extra thought. It's a very important decision to you. Um, and but 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 you don't want to go into that with just emotional with emotions and whatever you learned on bubble vision. You want to have a little more serious approach. So the more you know, the better decisions you're going to make. And and you shouldn't let someone necessarily sway you you just want to take that information and you have to process it so I, learning how to use information is part of getting good at this business i like to tell people that you only get good at investing by making mistakes and the estate mistakes are costly and that's part of the tuition and you pay enough tuition and you learn from your mistakes and you get good at it right um and if you're really really good at it you don't have to make the mistake yourself you can learn from other people's mistakes. I myself am not that talented, but maybe some of your listeners will be. So the point of, of uh, it's not so much going out and listening, it, it's, it's, it's knowing how to use that. And also people think that, that the idea of being patient when you're investing is buying something and then waiting. It's better to be patient to wait to buy the thing you're thinking about than being patient after you've bought it. Well, no, absolutely, Re really, really excellent points. And we're trying to have a diverse like group of guests here on this channel as well. Like even here at Deutsche Goldmesse, I'm already in Frankfurt. Like we have Henry Zieberg, for example, joining us and he's calling okay. for a gold, gold crash, for example. Oh, okay. We, we, so a bit, a bit of a different view as well. Like I, I like balanced views. So I really appreciate yeah, no, I clarifying agree. that. I agree, I agree. You should listen to so. both sides. Absolutely. And to, Bill, like maybe to come back to the bond market real quick um, and trying to understand it just a little better, how, how important actually it is, like and whether there is a threshold where you would personally get nervous. Is it maybe the 5% mark for the 10 year, for example, um, if we break that, well, that seems to be the high uh, point where that move is being confirmed uh, as well. And maybe as a part B of the question, what, what does that mean for next year? Meaning there needs to be a lot of refinancing happening in, in the U.S. in particular.
under with higher rates? Like, what does that? What are the ramifications here, Bill? Well, the ramifications are this: if the government keeps the term structure, which has a lot of maturities at the short term, you know, T bill short rates, if they don't change the term structure, just sit still. According to a recent interview I saw with Scott Besson, I have another math myself, but I'm sure it's right. The interest on the debt will go from 1.1 trillion to 1516 trillion all by itself. So that at 1.6, it would be almost twice the defense budget. So the government has a problem on its hands when it comes to this deficit. Um, and uh, so I think there's going to be real trouble in the bond market. I myself was short. Uh, had a modest short position in the 10 year bond futures, which I covered right before the election, just because I didn't know what kind of craziness could come out of it. And I've been kind of waiting to put it back on, you know, the, the it's, it's maybe a, a point or so lower than where I covered mine. And I'm trying to decide what to do next. I, I I'm not getting involved simply because the sentiment is so lopsided and I'm afraid we'll have a big rally, especially if the stock market sells off. So I'm, I'm talking about very short term oriented things, but if the stock market were to sell off, you might get a knee jerk reaction in the bond market, but outside of a knee jerk reaction to the weakness in the market and implied weakness in the economy, potentially the bond market's going to have a hard time rallying. I would like for it to rally. I would like for it to rally in a labored way so I could get short because my thesis is, and then if I got short, I would have some level that if, well, if rates got back to somewhere, I would probably cover. In other words, I'd have a bit of a stop loss, probably mentally rather than, than physically. But so I'm looking for an opportunity to get short short bonds um, uh, because I think this is it. Now, again, I'm making a leap of faith. When I start putting things on and I don't have corroboration, I have to be willing to cut back if the market goes against me to a certain degree, depending on the size of my position. So that's how I'm going to play it. No, I appreciate you clarifying that, Bill. Um, we've had an election in the U.S., and I think that's a good segue, that topic, mm -hmm. to, to the new, new, new U.S. president-elect here, Donald Trump, and how he could potentially interfere with the Fed and interest rates. Are you, A, are you worried about that? B, is that a possibility? And C, lo looking at the interest rates on the short-term debt here, on the T-bills, is that, is that a factor? Do you think that it will be a factor moving forward? Well, the fact that if they... The fact of the matter is, if they just roll the term structure as it is for the next year, the deficit is going to go to, and, and rates don't change, the deficit is going to go to 1.5 or 1.6 is an enormous problem, right? So um, now people are going to get excited, and I think to some degree rightfully so, about the things that the, that the, 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 this, the new administration is unlike probably any administration of modern times in that there's a there is a a, 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 a a very talented group of businessmen and women who've thrown in with the trump administration and are willing to take jobs to try to tackle a lot of problems so anyone who thinks that the government bureaucracy writ large in some total is one of the problems that we have in this country uh is going to be excited about what they see now the devil is going to be in the details. Um, um, you know, it's perfectly perverse that at the moment in time that we're probably going to start to deal with some of these out of control spending and wastefulness in Washington, D.C., that the bond market is about to have a conniption fit. I mean, that'd be perfectly perverse. Oh, we're finally doing the right thing. And now the bond market tanks. Well, it's tanking because of the kicking the can that's gone on for 30 years and the irresponsible policies of the Federal Reserve and everyone else. So, um, uh, nevertheless, people are going to probably get excited and hopeful about what it can mean. But these numbers are very daunting. So I would have to see the plans that they have to figure out how this is going to somehow um, be manageable, right? I mean, the easy way out is monetization. I mean, Donald Trump, I think, believes in a lower currency, not especially bullish for bonds believes in lower rates at all times, which not necessarily bullish for bonds, uh, won't be bothered by inflation, I don't think, at least not, you know, a, a little bit more relative to what we've just had. So I don't see him as especially bond friendly. Um, I think 
his team, I mean, I think that what Elon and Vivek plan to do with their Doge uh, department is, is all those things are, are, are good for um, maybe taking less pressure off inflation from a regulatory standpoint and for potentially getting things more under control down the road. But the tricky part is going to be na- navigating this period. So while we're doing constructive things, while, we're, 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 while we may be about to do constructive things, we have a big, huge problem we have to deal with. And, 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 and finessing our way through that is going to be very tricky. Bill, you mentioned monetization, and my mind went to the Fed buying U.S. Treasuries directly. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Do, do you see that as a possibility or a, as a danger to the market in general? Because if that happens, that's pretty much end game territory, I, well, I would say. They, right? they, the eight trillion that they have on the, you know, there's seven trillion of what they have on their balance sheet is them monetizing the market, and people gave them a standing ovation for doing it. Mm-hmm. Now. I think that that's why it matters if the bond market is taking away the printing press because they start doing that again and they get the opposite result. I don't know what they're going to do. You know, maybe they'll try to do some monetization. I can't believe it, but you know, look, okay, let's cook up a scenario. Let's say Nvidia's results tonight, which by the time you read this everyone or watch this, people will know what happened, but let's say they're not good enough and the market tanks. There's this island reversal above the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. It's kind of a negative pattern. Let's say the market tanks into year end instead of rallies as people expect. Well, maybe you get a big rally in the bond market and uh, folks start to get excited. Uh, but and, and, and maybe we could get into a period where they could think about monetization because the economy and the market were kind of weak. Uh, but I don't think they get very far. So it's, it's going to be a really tricky wicket. I mean, yeah, if you could if you could figure out a way to monetize, say, let's call it seven or eight trillion more, uh, that'd be 20 percent of GDP. Now you'd be back to like under 100. Maybe you could pull off some sort of financial gimmickry. I don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, We'll have to wait and see. I mean, but the, 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 the you know, it's the it's the it's the it's the quintessential version of the problem of the laws of large numbers. Right. It, they're going to be really hard to deal with. Talking about large numbers, we will need to raise a lot of capital next year to refinance. I'm, I mentioned that earlier, but do, do you see a liquidity crisis on the horizon at all? Or do you think that debt will just be soaked up by somebody? I don't see reasons to expect a liquidity crisis at this juncture. Uh, I, I can see how the ingredients could be. In, if we got a runaway decline in the bond market and people started to freak out, then they'd be thinking about these real estate uh, the, 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 the bad marks in the bank system on the real estates. A lot of these banks have bonds that they're now holding to maturity and they got the liquidity um, um, backstop of the Fed to be able to borrow, borrow against them. I mean, the bank system's already got some issues. So if, the, if the, we had a, a really serious decline in the bond market, then there could be some liquidity problems. And then perversely, the Fed would try to fix them with more liquidity, which has got us into this problem in the first place. So you can see how their hand could get quite complicated very easily. That's why it's important to understand these problems. So when another element and another piece of the puzzle falls in, you know how it fits and what to do with it. A hundred percent. No, it's, uh, it's like we spent a lot of time on the bond market. And I think we got to switch gears here a little bit. But I think um, Simon Hunt mentioned in, a, in an interview with us that he, he said the bond market is the root of all evil. And I see a lot of dangers coming from the bond market potentially in the next 12 months personally. So that's why uh, yeah. I stayed on that topic for so long. I, did, I don't disagree. I mean, my little experience of being short bonds was the first time I've been short. I, mean, I shorted them a little bit in 21, but I probably hadn't been short bonds in a, 20 years up to that point. Anyway, no, no, um, maybe we'll talk a U.S. dollar real quick. And the U.S. dollar has been showing quite a bit of strength, and a lot, a lot of analysts are forecasting a further, further rally, especially in the Dixie, compared to other, other weaker currencies potentially, um, maybe rallying to 120 points. Like, what's your take on the U.S. dollar? Um, you, you mentioned Trump wants a weaker dollar, uh, which seems a bit contradictory to what he said in 2016, where he wanted a stronger dollar. So I'm no, curious no, he didn't, like, want, he didn't want a stronger dollar. He wanted a weaker dollar. He's a mercantilist. Okay. He wants to export, wants to make ex- imports more expensive. He wants a weaker dollar. It's not. No. He, no, I'm he, curious what your take on the dollar is, though. Like, con- where's it con- going? He's got a conundrum. Sell my dollar yeah. to get debt, get it lower to make imports more expensive and exports cheaper, but buy my dollar to buy my debt. So he's got a conundrum, and I think he'll take the path of a lower dollar. 
I don't believe he wants a stronger dollar at all. I don't. I. I. I don't. I don't think that's in his DNA. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the people around him are going to convince him that that's the right tactic, um, and and maybe it will be. But X that I don't. I don't. I mean, the dollar's just the one-eyed man of the land of the blind, right? We have the military, and we're we're closer to preserving free speech than any of the rest of the English-speaking countries. You look at the, you look at what they're doing in England, or and even in Canada, Australia. So uh, I don't see how you can. I mean, so. And now America's kind of moved back away from this kind of uh, um, censorship path we've been on. It, it looks that way. So we have the military, we have the country, we have more freedoms. So the dollar is going to stay the reserve currency. Having said that, they're just colored pieces of paper. They don't stand for anything. So the U.S. Uh, could see the currency decline, most likely, I would think, against the yen. I think... I think sometime in the next 12 months, the yen is going to have a very substantial rally. Now, whether that gets kicked off because of something the Japanese do or something Trump does, I mean, the euro is a basket case because Europe's a basket case. I don't mean that the people that live there. I mean, the people that run the show there. Right. Um, and I mean, would you, I, I, you know, I mean, maybe their, invest, their investment cases to be, be made specifically, I'm sure. But at large, the euro only rallies because the dollar's going down and people got to do something. You, you know, the, 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 the currency choices are especially poor, the worst I've seen in my lifetime. Um, and that's one of the reasons why gold has done well. It's done well because central bankers around the world that aren't part of the G7 clique are buying gold, as are Chinese and Indians and, and thoughtful Western investors. There's been no real stampede in America. You can see it in the GLD. Um, you know, it, net net on the year when gold's up over 20 percent, the ounces taken in by the GLD is about flat. There's been retail buying at Costco. That's been a big product for them. But you haven't seen any real, real enthusiasm in gold. But that's the, I believe that's the reason why it's done well. It is a de facto currency. Um, a lot of people are making the case that Bitcoin is. I, I'm not in that camp, but I understand the arguments. Um, and, and so I think that's why it's done well. But the, 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 I think the dollar is on borrowed time. And, you know, if you look at if you look at what we're doing, we've got this deficit that is over. I mean, sorry, national debt that's over 100 percent of GDP. We've got all these unfunded liabilities that are even larger, but we won't, we won't go there. Um, and we've got the, we've got a huge amount of our debt rolling over every year. I mean, that's that's a that's an emerging market kind of a scenario. So we've got a m emerging market macro finances when it comes to the deficit. And that's because Janet Yellen was playing games. I mean, look, I thought she did a terrible job at the Fed. I thought she's done a terrible job at Treasury. You know, each Fed chairman has been worse. Greenspan was irresponsible. Bernanke was a drunk. Yellen was worse than Bernanke. And Powell's worse than all, all of them. OK, they've each been more responsible and caused bigger, bigger problems. So what she did at Treasury was instead of doing the right thing for the country, which would have been to try to term out the debt, extend maturities when the rates went to zero. You know, she came out of there and started playing games and funding them more at the short end because she wanted to try to keep the markets going for her boss. So anyway, it, the, 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 our deficit situation and national debt situation is a real nightmare. It really is. And I don't see how that's good for the dollar. I get the bull case, but I, I don't, I don't, the, the problem is the other currencies are just as bad, if not worse. No, no from a personal perspective, I love traveling to the US. So I, I, I'd love a weaker dollar because the euro is not looking strong right now to, against the dollar. Right. So that's from a personal perspective. But uh, you, you, op you, you mentioned something that I want to follow up on. Like, I don't want to spend too long on it, but the yen carry trade. It sort of yeah. ties into what we discussed with the bond market earlier. People borrow in yen, buy the bonds, and take four four percent home or so, live off the arbitrage. Like that yen carry trade breaks down. Like, how does that sort of impact what we discussed earlier about the bond market liquidity the next year? Because I think that could be a real trigger, especially looking at uh, early August. We've seen a bit of a case study or proof of concept here for what I just mentioned, where the market dropped rather suddenly because it was a rush to liquidity so i'm curious what your thoughts are on that and if that could be like that that black swan event that everybody saw coming potentially uh no i don't think so i was actually long the yen. i got lucky i was long the end when that happened and uh i saw a lot of people's hair on fire <laughs> i think you probably flushed the hottest of the hot money it's no secret that the japanese have these have 
of of all layers, whether it's the corporations or the the, the, the you know the the, uh, the Mrs. Watt Nobbies of the world have uh, exposure to U.S. equities, and they and they so the, I think it's the stock market that's helped drag the dollar up from from their perspective. I think the underlying bid in yen, sorry, in dollar in the dollar versus the yen uh, coming out of Japan is not so much the yen carry trade as them trying to get access to, to, to the U.S. stock market. You know, for the longest time, the market was going up and the dollar was going up. Now the dollar is not really going up against it. Yes, it has rallied from the lows. But if you look at the bigger picture, it's been kind of sideways now for six months or so longer. So uh, I don't I don't think the yen carry trade is the functional equivalent of the end of the world. Like people were acting like when the subprime trade started to blow up, that was the signal that the real estate bubble was starting to unwind and it was going to get brutal. I don't think the yen carry trade has anywhere near that significance. My okay. personal opinion. My no, perfect. That's exactly what I, to, what, what I wanted to get out of my question is like, it was really how important is it? And should we be watching it closely? Right? I don't think it's that big of a deal. No, perfect. Awesome. Um, let, let's segue over to, uh, to, to gold. You, you, you opened the door here with your previous answer and we need to talk about it. Gold has done tremendously well just until early November, just right before the elections. Now it's fighting a stronger US dollar, high, uh, rising bond yields and to, uh, just out ETF outflows as well, just a lack of interest in gold right now. Um, where, where do you see gold headed and what's the role of gold in the current environment? Well, I think I just described the role of gold. It's an alternative currency that's no one's liability. Central bankers can't print it. Miners have to make it. Anyone who's looked at the miners know that it's expensive for miners to make it. They, the supply is growing a percent a year or so. It's not, not incremental, uh, incrementally very large. All the gold that's ever been found is still in existence, however. Uh, so anyway, gold is a gold. I think people should think of gold as a, as a, as a, a, a currency that's that's uh, nearly impossible to debase. Um, uh, so uh, that's the right way to think about it. And you can think about it. It does well uh, uh, in when uh, inversely to confidence in people's leaders or central banks. So if you're in a place with a, you know, if you're in a, a place with a crazy uh, uh, government and uh, irresponsible central bank, you need to have exposure to gold. If you have the opposite, you don't, but nobody really has the opposite these days. Uh, well, I mean, obviously there are exceptions, but uh, uh, so that's the role of gold. Um, and I think prospectively, um, I, I, to me, it was fairly predictable there would be a sell-off around the election. I, I, I actually lightened up on, on some of my mining positions just because a they had done quite well but that wasn't really enough it was the fact that i thought that if trump got elected which i thought was the likely outcome then uh gold would get sold just like it was in 216. people would say okay we're going to run that playbook and i think that's basically what happened i mean in the open interest in the futures market went ran has gone from 580,000 contracts to 500 if it was down around 480 that it, or 470, that'd be kind of the low end of where we've been for the last year. That'd be great. The, the, the daily sentiment index was um, in the hot in, in the 80s. It got down to 25 the other day. So I think that there's been the, the big flush has done. It's it chased a lot of people out of the futures market. It flips sentiment around. So I think it can grind higher again. I'm not one of these people that thinks that I know where the ultimate price is going to be. I don't know. I feel lucky if I can get the direction right. Um, I, nothing would, nothing really tempts me to sell my physical gold. What it would take would be for us to get into a prolonged period of the central, sorry, the printing press taking away the, the, sorry, the bond market taking the printing press away from the central bank and pushing rates up. So you're getting a, like where they had no faith and let's say, you know, interest rates were seven, eight, nine again, which would be hard to do with the size of our deficit. But if that were to be the case, I can see a scenario where, the bond market loses total confidence in the central banks and the governments and the bonds are a disaster. And that forces in some sort of new regime, kind of like what Volcker had to do in, uh, in 1979. Then it might be interesting to, to swap your gold for treasury bonds, but we're not even close to thinking about that. So I'm not even close to thinking about doing that. I'm just laying it out there as for what the end game may look like. 
Yeah. Before we get mining stocks, Bill, just real quick, silver. I have to ask. Same, same trajectory as as gold. Do you, do you put it on the same pedestal here? Do yeah. You say well, the same level. Silver is the poor man's gold, and uh, it tends to do better when the when when individuals are much more lathered up about the markets than they currently are. Obviously, silver's been running a deficit for a couple of years now. I don't know the top, number off the top of my head. I should go look at it. But so the supply and demand there is some of it does get consumed, unlike gold. But I think, yeah, I think silver is going to have if gold uh, finds a way to go on another run and heads towards 3000, I think silver will move disproportionately. Maybe it'll trade from 30 to 45 or it'll do something stupid. You have to understand silver is a small market and it has a wild personality. I mean, literally, it's a wild personality. I mean, for it to move two bucks on a piece of news is not a big deal. I mean, that's seven percent. So that's quite a move. So people that get involved need to know that it's it's a wild child. But I think it will do particularly well on the next run that gold has. Um, if that's under starting now, I don't know. But anyway, I, I, I think it will. You know, but again, it's it's really volatile. Absolutely, yeah. No, you you mentioned it. Like gold silver ratio is like eighty five right now, so it definitely yeah. wasn't like catching up to do. If you were to yeah. use that as a valid I, metric, I caution people to. You, but but I wouldn't buy silver because of that ratio. It's so easy to get caught up in thinking that that matters, and it's more just a demonstration of silver's relevance versus gold throughout history for different times. And while I silver's, I, I believe it's it it, it it's. It's it's cheap relative to gold in that it uh, the problem with it is it's a co-product and it gets it gets created often from copper mine lead zinc mines and things like that so it, it doesn't have the economic sensitivity so it's, there are certain periods where the price is down and they keep they keep making that, that's not today's problem any case uh, silver is a, the wild child version of gold I think is the right way to think about it. No, absolutely. And I, I agree. Um, last topic I want to tackle with you is the mining stock valuations and, and the major miners. You, you posted about Q3 financials of Nico Eagle, for example. But I want to tie it in with a little bit with what we discussed earlier. You mentioned retirement funds and uh, just passively investing in ETFs. And, and one thing I've been saying for years. No, is no, that no, no. They passively invest in their ETF, the Vanguard ETF or the BlackRock ETF. It's an all market ETF. I don't mean to say that they go out and buy individual ETFs. And, and I think that's an important concept for people to understand, right? Yeah. Like I have a beef with passive investing and 401k investing personally. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm yeah, talking about. Exactly. So I, I just mentioned it wrong, but uh, ETFs my problem with a different kind of passive. It's not quite as passive as the other passive. Yeah, it's a lazy man's investing. That's what I call it, yeah, which is fine. That's true. No problem. But it's like, nowhere, nowhere near as dangerous as what the passive, the, the, the true. Vanguard BlackRock passive bit. That's the real danger. Yeah. My, my point was that we need to scare the 401k investors to drive mining stock valuations higher again and have a prolonged bull market. That's a point I've been trying to make for years because we're missing generalist investors in our sector. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, like you talk, talk about mining stock valuations, like the, the, dis, the disconnect between, let's say, gold price and mining stock valuations are is, is insane. Like. It, it hasn't caught up. Yes, some of the stocks have moved. Like you you wrote about Igniku Eagle, for example. That stock has done decently well. It's outperformed gold, for example. But Barrick and Newmont, for example, have brutally underperformed. Well, because, here today Barrick is and Newmont, because Barrick and Newmont are kind of garbage. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's like Newmont is in the S&P 500. <laughs> yeah, okay, but let's... Okay, so I was a lead director at Pan American Silver. Uh, I stepped off the board in 2011. I got on the board in 1996. So I was there for a long time while the price, I, I, I retired from the board because the price of silver went from four to 40 and the price of Pan America went from four to about 40. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I was lucky because then the price went down after that. But any case, my point is I've been around the industry for a while and there, there has been no wild, indiscriminate buying at all, which often there is with a move like this in gold. People have been burned a few times. The problem with mining is that there are so many impediments to be able to do it well. You have to be in a good jurisdiction from a, a legal standpoint. Look at the problems people have had in Mexico just getting the water licenses and those types of permits. And Mexico is considered to be a country friendly to gold, right? So you have to be in good jurisdictions. I think it's important to have ore bodies that have um, higher uh, grams per ton 
and the ore bodies have exploration potential. Uh, well, once you start to say that those are your criteria, the list of things that you can buy shrink way down. I've had big positions in Ecnico, um, Alamos, West Dome, and, uh, and, and to some degree, New Gold. Those have been where I've concentrated there. I was forced to make much bigger individual positions than I normally would because I did not want to have to buy the barracks and the new months of the world because they're, 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 they, they tried to grow too big just for getting bigger and thinking that would solve their problems. That's my, 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 my criticism. Uh, they have a lot of mines in bad places, bad for various different reasons. Um, Newmont's acquisition strategy has been horrible, right? They, 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 uh, they have had huge problems with their acquisition of Gold Corp and again with Newcrest. I mean, not, not necessarily the acquisition dynamics, but what they acquired and what they're doing. So they haven't really done anything all that special. Um, and, 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 uh, and Barrick is kind of the same. They have so many mines in bad places. Uh, so they have issues. So, and then there's a lot of mines that are just marginal to begin with. And we're, uh, and we're at a moment in time where Wall Street plays this ridiculous game of beat the number. Can you beat the number? Can you manage expectations? They don't spend 10 seconds talking about the underlying dynamics of the business. So that laziness spills over into mining. So a mining company misses, misses the quarter on one line item. Who cares, right? Nobody bought a mining stock for the quarter. They're buying a mining stock because they want exposure to precious metals. And they think the price of precious metals is going up over time. And they want to capitalize on that. But the game doesn't, isn't, got, isn't being played that way. And a part of it is because, as you note, um, you know, there isn't that much, there isn't that much interest. And my point is, when they start buying the GLD for real, showing there's interest in North, from North American investors or the Canadian version of that, then you'll see the mining stocks do better, I think. But a lot of them just aren't great uh, choices. Some of them have mine lives that are only going to be seven or eight years. Others have mine lives that they've only proven up seven or eight years worth of production. But if you know the know how to look at it, the mine might be in existence for 20 or 30 years. Well, those two kind of stocks often kind of trade equally these days. Not exactly. But people treat the net asset value, which is an attempt to calculate what you're going to get down the road. The problem with that is analysis it's flawed. It relies too much on what your reserves are. If you have an open pit mine and you've drilled out everything, you kind of know what you're going to get. But if you've got an underground mine that goes way the hell down there, you, you only can prove up your reserves as you go down through the mine, right? So you don't know what it's going to be. So to look at you, so all of the simplistic measures that Wall Street likes to use now, they get promulgated on Bubble Vision are, uh, did they beat the number, right? Uh, well, you know, and, 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 and they look at the NAV, the net asset value. It's garbage. You have to look beneath the surface. And, but, but none of the mining analysts are doing that. They don't differentiate between, they don't make that point. You haven't read that report in one mining report ever because they're not getting paid. So they're not really doing research. And so to say that a company like Wesdome is fairly valued at its NAV is, is ridiculous. It just shows you don't know anything about how to analyze mining stock, but that's, that, that's my beef. The, the, the same level of lameness goes on in tech stocks. Oh, they beat the number. They raised the expectations. It's all about playing the game. And, and if you're playing the game and in, 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 in tech, it's, you know, in, in some of these places, it's easier to play the game for a variety of reasons, easier than it is in mining. And so they get left for dead. And, you know, that'll change. I don't know what the tip of psychology. I think the gold market itself may, but maybe there'll be an event. I don't know. But the problem is there's a lot of crummy mining stocks. You know, yeah. it's, that's part of the problem. You do, it's, it's, you know, you have to really do your homework. And it's hard to know what's what if you haven't been at it for a while. Now, you know, so. I have one last follow-up question here for you, Bill, before we sort of come to the summary, uh, sum, okay. summary question at the end here. And uh, the, the mining stuff have been trying to play the Wall Street game, meaning focusing on shareholder value, like dividends, share buybacks, mm -hmm. and, and very, very few selective growth investments. Very few. The question is now, Bill, like you personally, are you more of a value investor or more of a growth investor? Do you want to see a Barrick or who, a company XYZ buy a mine? Or do you rather do see them do 
pay out dividends and do share buybacks and things with their free cash flow. <laughs> okay. I, I think the dividends and the buybacks, depending on the individual company and when they're doing it, can make sense. Um, but um, the funny thing about great hair is as you, you accumulate it over time by experience, along with experience, when my hair was black like yours, I was a value investor. I wanted to buy things as cheap as possible. Cheap, cheap, cheap. And over the years, I've learned that paying up for a bit, paying up a bit for a better business is better than buying an average business super cheap. So when it comes to mining, I have, I assume we're still talking about mining. I have a very strict criteria. I want it to be in the right jurisdictions. I want what I believe is to be strong management. I want high ore grades and I want growth potential in the properties that they already have. That's a small list. And, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's worked this year. It's worked particularly well because if you didn't have a lot of good things happening, you were penalized. Um, um, and <clears throat> Ignico finally has, was able to outshine say Barrick and Newmont and, and, and so has Alamos. But if you look at what John McCleskey's done there, it's done, it's just been brilliant. Everything he's done in the last group of years, he, up until a year ago, couldn't get any respect. So, <clears throat> I, I kind of got a little off on a tangent there. I, I kind of, I, I, lost, I forgot the original question. No, it's like, it, it's really like value or growth. Like what oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. from the so, mining company. So, so right? now, whereas to, to, to put a further point on that, I would have, I was, I would have averaged down a bit blindly back in the early days. Now I won't average down past a per, per a certain point. I would rather average up as things start to go the way that I think that they ought to. So I'm a, I'm a little more of, of, uh, uh, growth um, and, and paying a, a, a maybe a, a slightly above average price for what I think is a great investment rather than a below average price or way below average price for kind of an average investment. Yeah. Okay. No, appreciate that. Thanks for humoring my question here, Bill. Yeah, no, it's um, a good question. You know, it's like we're, we're getting up to the hour here and this is great for a Sunday episode here. So I don't mind running a bit longer because we're putting this out on Sunday. But maybe as a summary question for, for all that we've discussed, very holistic approach here. If you had a million dollars to invest today, Bill, like how would you allocate that money? Well, the problem is depends on the age of the person and what they're. No, is it like you, let's assume it's you. Let's just to summarize sort of what we discussed. Let's assume it's you. You have a million dollars to invest today. Yeah, but, how would but, you allocate? But I think that that's not. I mean, my kids are grown. Um, I fortunately have a decent amount of money. Uh, so so. I'm not necessarily the right guy. What I would say, I would say this way, a lot, a lot depends on who you are and what your discretionary income is. You have to have some inflation protection. Okay. So that means you have to own some gold or silver or something that you think is an infl is, is, uh, will protect you against inflation. So you have to have somewhere, I would say 10 to 20, 25% in things that fill that bucket. Now it doesn't have to all be precious metals. You might have a business that is a is a unit grower that's got price pr protection, um, you know, got a you know uh, got barriers to entry in its business so it can keep its margins up, and and that will do great in inflationary period. Real growth does well during inflationary periods because it's hard to come by. So I, I think, I, I and and I think to the extent that you own fixed income, whether you want to have twenty percent in fixed income or thirty or more. The, the more fixed income you have that's longer than, say, three or four years in maturity, the more precious metals or inflation protections you need to protect that. So you may be at a point in your life where you need more fixed income, so you have to buy more bonds. You have to allocate more to the inflation protection side of your portfolio in case, in case inflation is worse than we think or, more, or, or, or does more damage, the bond market's more in trouble. So the more fixed income you're exposed to, the more inflation protection you need. Equities as, as a class won't protect you against inflation. I've tried my, my equity exposure is all either mining stocks or some speculative uh, unique companies that I think have growth, have barriers to entry and uh, don't require a lot of capital to, 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 to fill those things. So I've tried to pick things that can grow through any period that don't need the economy, don't need the equity market. Now you always need the equity market to some degree, but over time, if you are a real unit grower with with uh, uh, margin power, uh, margin protection, barriers to entry, you will grow through any period. 
So though it's the more about what you own than the than the percentage in the bucket. You know, so um, uh, I probably have say fifty percent or more, maybe say yeah, say fifty percent or more, maybe sixty percent, sixty five percent in different kinds of equities. A big chunk of that's mining. A, 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 a decent piece is the section that I told you about these kind of wild unit growers. And then I, I can hedge those unit growers with shorts, you know? And so I'll protect that piece with my shorts. So that's the other thing you have to ask yourself is if this passive bid starts to unravel, what are you going to do about it? You already have to have a plan about what you're going to do about it before it happens. So you won't get frozen. And so I'm looking for any signs of it and I'll increase my short position. So I don't like to give exact, exact examples because what's good for me is not necessarily good for anyone else even somebody who's my age and all that, because and my my risk tolerance is different. My skill set is different. I can have way more exposure to precious metals than the average person can, can, because I'm willing to be ruthless about a certain amount of risk control, no matter how much I like the company. I have to because I have to have big exposure, because I wound up with five stocks or four stocks instead of twenty. That meant my positions were huge, so I had to treat it differently, and so. There, there, there are just different things required if you're going to run things different ways. And I can't hand out, a, well, this is what I would do if the person doesn't have the skills to be able to deal with the negative parts of what comes along with that sort of exposure. No, Bill, I appreciate that. I still need to refine that question a little bit because I think it's, it's a good summary question. It sort of ties everything together that we've discussed, right? Because yeah. uh, like I mentioned to you before hitting the record button, if we were to talk about bonds and it's the worst thing on the planet and you go short bonds, but you recommend 60% bond exposure, then uh, we might have to re-record right. and uh, right. <laughs> to talk about something well, else, right? In all due respect, I think I did a good job of answering your question. <laughs> no, I think so as well. So I really appreciate it. Bill, this was a tremendous conversation. I could have gone on for hours with you, especially the mining part is really interesting because and how we can tie it together to the main markets, of course, or with the main well, markets. We can follow up that. We can follow up the mining stocks down the road if it looks like they're starting to get traction. How's that? Let's uh, let's hope so. Six to eight weeks. That's uh, as long as I've got patience for the doldrums right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, fantastic. Bill, where, where oh, can we follow your work? You'll get more patience when you get more gray hair. <laughs> oh, it's like I've been in this industry. Like, it's like I've been doing mining stuff for 15 years, and I still have wow. to see a proper. Bull you should market. have more gray hair then. <laughs> oh, it's coming! It's coming! Like the fil short it's a good selling. filter. Short selling is what turned my hair gray. I ran a short only fund from 1996 to 2008. I closed it down when the Fed started QE. But that's what gave me all my gray hair. I'm only 36, oh. really. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> love that one. <laughs> awesome. Bill, we have, definitely have to do this again. Maybe we'll catch up early in the new year and try to set the scene a little bit for 2025. Okay. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for being patient with me as well. No where, where can where can we send our viewers? Okay, so um, I write a column every day about the market. Some days I write a lot. Sometimes I write a little. Sometimes I write about insights I have. It just depends. I've been writing this column since 1996. It's been on my own website since 2004. I also answer investment questions. But it's very expensive. It's $130 a year. I, I make that as a joke. I had to price it somewhere, but I wanted to make it such that a kid with a paper out could afford it, right? So, oh, where to find it? Uh, it's FleckensteinCapital.com. And then I'm on Twitter. I don't I don't talk all that much on it, although I pop off from time to time. My handle at Twitter is at FleckCap. At FleckCap.com. That's my website. <laughs> Fantastic. Bill, like we'll definitely link to everything down below as okay. well in the description. No so I really appreciate it. Uh, okay. it, was, it was a great pleasure. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. As you can tell, I'm in Frankfurt. I'm at the Deutsche Gold Messe. We're in the middle of setup. And I do appreciate your patience with us here. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, put them down below. I'll, have, I'll be happy to forward them to Bill as well. And uh, a free way to support our channel is just simply by hitting that like and subscribe button. We appreciate it tremendously, and thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your weekend when you're watching or listening to this on the Sunday that we're publishing it, and uh, all the best up there. We'll be back with lots more, especially from Deutsche Gold Messe. Thank you so much. <laughs>